Good day and welcome to the second fiscal quarter earnings release and conference call for Prospect Capital Corporation. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to John Barry, Chairman and CEO. Please go ahead. Thank you, Carrie. Joining me on the call today, as usual, are Guru Isaac, our President and Chief Operating Officer, and Kristen Van Dask, our Chief Financial Officer. Kristen? Thank you, John. This call is the property of Prospect Capital Corporation. Unauthorized use is prohibited. This call contains forward-looking statements within the meaning of the securities laws that are intended to be subject to safe harbor protection. Actual outcomes and results could differ materially from those forecasts due to the impact of many factors. We do not undertake to update our forward-looking statements unless required by law. For additional disclosure, see our earnings press release and our 10Q filed previously and available on the Investor Relations tab on our website, prospectstreet.com. Now I'll turn the call back over to John. Thank you, Kristen. In the December quarter, our net investment income, or NII, was $81.6 million, or $0.21 cents per common share, up $0.06 cents from the prior quarter. Our net income was $306 million, or $0.80 cents per common share, up $0.35 cents from the prior quarter. Our NAB stood at $8.00. 96 cents per common share in December, up 56 cents and 7% from the prior quarter, and representing our third quarter in a row with NAV growth. In the December quarter, our net debt to equity ratio was 61.1%, down 13% from March, and down 7% from September. In May, we moved our minimum 1940 Act regulatory asset coverage to 150%, equivalent to 200% debt to equity. We have no plans to, to increase our actual drawn debt leverage beyond our historical target of 0.7 to 0.85 debt to equity and we are significantly below such target range now. We are announcing monthly cash common shareholder distributions of $0.06 cents per share for each of February, March, and April. These three months represent the 42nd, 43rd, and 44th consecutive $0.06 cent dividends. Consistent with past practice, we plan on our next set of shareholder distribution announcements in May. Since our IPO nearly 17 years ago through our April 2021 distribution at the current share count, we will have paid out $8.60 per common share to original shareholders aggregating over $3.3 billion in cumulative distributions to all common shareholders. Since, since October 2017, our NII per common share has aggregated $2.55, while our shareholder distributions per share have aggregated $2.34 resulting in our NII exceeding distributions during this period by $0.21 cents per share. Our NII covered distributions in the June 2020 fiscal year and have covered distributions in the 2021 fiscal year to date as well. We are also pleased to announce continued preferred shareholder distributions 
on the heels of successful launches of our $1 billion, 5.5% preferred stock program, and $250 million, 5.5% preferred stock program. Thank you. I'll now turn the call over to Greer. Thank you, John. Uh, our scale platform with over $6.1 billion of assets and undrawn credit continues to deliver solid performance in the current challenging environment. Our experienced team consists of around 100 professionals, which represents one of the largest middle market investment groups in the industry. With our scale, longevity, experience, and deep bench, we continue to focus on a diversified investment strategy that spans third-party, private equity, sponsor-related lending, direct, non-sponsor lending, prospect-sponsored operating and financial buyouts, structured credit, and real estate yield investing. Consistent with past cycles, we expect during the next downturn to see an increase in secondary opportunities coupled with wider spread primary opportunities with a pullback from other investment groups, particularly more highly leveraged ones. This diversity allows us to source a broad range and high volume of opportunities, then select in a disciplined bottoms-up manner the opportunities we deem to be the most attractive on a risk-adjusted basis. Our team typically evaluates thousands of opportunities annually and invests in a disciplined manner in a low single-digit percentage of such opportunities. Our non-bank structure gives us the flexibility to invest in multiple levels of the corporate capital stack, with a preference for secured lending and senior loans. As of December, our portfolio at fair value comprised over 47% secured first lien, 21% other senior secured debt, 13% subordinated structured notes with underlying secured first lien collateral, and 18% equity investments, which results in a stable 82% of our investments being assets with underlying secured debt benefiting from borrower-pledged collateral. Prospect's approach is one that generates attractive risk-adjusted yields and our performing interest-bearing investments were generating an annualized yield of 12.2% as of December, which was up 0.6% from the prior quarter. We achieved this increase despite a headwind from the past year decline in LIBOR, though we expect stability now due to our LIBOR floors. We also hold equity positions in certain investments they can act as yield enhancers or capital gains contributors as such positions generate distributions. We've continued to prioritize senior and secure debt with our originations to protect against downside risk while still achieving above market yields through credit selection discipline and a differentiated origination approach. As of December, we held 122 direct portfolio companies even with the prior quarter, with a fair value of over $5.6 billion, which is an increase of $239 million from the prior quarter. We also continue to invest in a diversified fashion across many different portfolio company industries with no significant industry concentration. The largest is 16%. As of December, our asset concentration in the energy industry was 1.2% in the hotel, restaurant, leisure sector, 0.4%, and in the retail industry, 0%. Non-accruals as a percentage of total assets stood at approximately 0.7% in December, flat from the prior quarter. Our weighted average middle market portfolio net leverage stood at 4.97 times EBITDA, down 0.31 from the prior quarter, and substantially below our reporting peers. Our weighted average EBITDA per portfolio company stood at $83 million in December, 
which was an increase from 78.5 million in the prior quarter. Originations in the December quarter aggregated 346 million. We also experienced 338 million of repayments and exits as a validation of our capital preservation objective and sell down of larger credit exposures, which resulted in net originations of 8 million. During the December quarter, our originations comprised 75% middle market finance, 24.8% real estate, and 0.2% middle market lending buyouts. To date, we've deployed significant capital in the real estate arena through our private REIT strategy, largely focused on multifamily workforce stabilized yield acquisition with attractive 10-year plus financing. NPRC, our private REIT, has real estate properties that have benefited over the last several years from rising rents, strong occupancies, high returning value added renovation programs, and attractive financing recapitalization, resulting in an increase in cash yields as a validation of this income growth business alongside our corporate credit businesses. NPRC, as of December, has exited completely 33 properties at an average IRR of 23.5%, with an objective to redeploy capital into new property acquisitions, including with repeat property manager relationships. We continue to monitor our rent collections, which are holding up well in the current environment. Our structured credit business has delivered attractive cash yields, demonstrating the benefits of pursuing majority stakes, working with world-class management teams, providing strong collateral underwriting through primary issuance, and focusing on attractive risk-adjusted opportunities. As of December, we held $745 million across 39 non-recourse subordinated structured notes investments. These underlying structured credit portfolios comprised around 1,700 loans and a total asset base of around 17 billion. As of December, this structured credit portfolio experienced a trailing 12-month default rate of 206 basis points, down 14 from the prior quarter, and representing 177 basis points less than the broadly syndicated market default rate of 383 basis points. In December, this portfolio generated an annualized cash yield of 17.2% and gap yield of 16.8%. As of December, our subordinated structured credit portfolio has generated $1.26 billion in cumulative cash distributions to us, representing around 90% of our original investment. Through December, We've also exited nine investments, totaling $263 million, with an average realized IRR of 16.7% and cash-on-cash cash multiple of 1.48 times. Our subordinate structured credit portfolio consists entirely of majority-owned positions. Such positions can enjoy significant benefits compared to minority holdings in the same tranche. In many cases, we receive fee rebates because of our majority position. As majority holder, we control the ability to call a transaction in our sole discretion in the future, and we believe such options add substantial value to our portfolio. We have the option of waiting years to call a transaction in an optimal fashion rather than when loan asset valuations might be temporarily low. We as majority investor can refinance liabilities on more advantageous terms, remove bond baskets in exchange for better terms from debt investors in the deal, and extend or reset the investment period to enhance value. We've completed 27 refinancings and resets since December 2017. So far in the current March quarter, we have booked 12 million in originations and experienced 53 million of repayments for 41 million of net repayments. Originations have comprised 56.5% real estate, 41.4% middle market finance, and 2% middle market lending buyout. Thank you.
I'll now turn the call over to Kristen. Thank you, Greer. We believe our prudent leverage, diversified access to matched book funding, substantial majority of unencumbered assets, weighting toward unsecured fixed rate debt, avoidance of unfunded asset commitments, and lack of near-term maturities demonstrate both balance sheet strength as well as substantial liquidity to capitalize on attractive opportunities. Our company has locked in a ladder of liabilities extending 22 years into the future. Today, we have zero debt maturing until July 2022. Our total unfunded eligible commitments to non-control portfolio companies totals approximately $21 million, or less than 0.4% of our assets. Our combined balance sheet cash and undrawn revolving credit facility commitments currently stand at approximately $845 million. We are a leader and an innovator innovator in the marketplace. We were the first company in our industry to issue a convertible bond, develop a notes program, issue under a bond ATM, acquire another BDC, and many other lists of firsts. Now we've added our programmatic perpetual preferred issuance to that list of firsts. Shareholders and unsecured creditors alike should appreciate the thoughtful approach differentiated in our industry which we have taken toward construction of the right-hand side of our balance sheet. As of December 2020, we held approximately $4.21 billion of our assets as unencumbered assets, representing approximately 74% of our portfolio. The The remaining assets are pledged to prospect capital funding, where in September 2019, we completed an extension of our revolver to a refreshed five year maturity. We currently have $1.0775 billion of commitments from 30 banks. The facility revolves until September 2023, followed by a year of amortization with interest distributions continuing to be allowed to us. Of our floating rate assets, 89.6% have LIBOR floors with a weighted average floor of 1.62%. Outside of our revolver, and benefiting from our unencumbered assets, we've issued at Prospect Capital Corporation, including in the past few years, multiple types of investment grade unsecured debt, including convertible bonds, institutional bonds, baby bonds, and program notes. All of these types of unsecured debt have no financial covenants, no asset restrictions, and no cross defaults with our revolver. We enjoy an investment-grade triple B negative rating from S&P, an investment-grade BAA3 rating from Moody's, an investment-grade triple B negative rating from Kroll, and an investment-grade triple B rating from Egan Jones. We've now tapped the unsecured term debt market on multiple occasions to ladder our maturities and to extend our liability duration out 22 years. Our debt maturities extend through 2043. With so many banks and debt investors across so many debt tranches, we have substantially reduced our counterparty risk over the years. In the December 2020 quarter, we completed successful tender offerings, retiring around 66 million of our 2022 notes, 30 million of our 2023 notes, and 10 million of our 6.375% 2024 notes. In the current March quarter, through tender processes, we have retired 20 million in 2025 notes and another 27 million of 2022 notes, thereby taking that tranche down to 136 million. We recently, in the current March quarter, issued 325 million in unsecured debt maturing in January 2026 with a coupon of 3.7%. We have continued to substitute more expensive term debt with significantly lower cost revolving credit with an incremental 1.3% cost and our newly issued 2026 notes. We also have continued with our weekly programmatic internotes issuance on an efficient funding basis. We now have eight separate unsecured debt issuances aggregating 1.4 billion, not including our program notes, with maturities extending to June 2029. As of December 2020, 
we had 759 million of program notes outstanding with staggered maturities through October 2043. We also recently added a shareholder loyalty benefit to our dividend reinvestment plan, or DRIP, that allows for a 5% discount to the market price for DRIP participants. As many brokerage firms either do not make DRIPs automatic or have their own synthetic DRIPs with no such 5% discount benefit, we encourage any shareholder interested in DRIP participation to contact your broker. Make sure to specify you wish to participate in the Prospect Capital Corporation DRIP plan through DTC at a 5% discount and obtain confirmation of same from your broker. Now I'll turn the call back over to John. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Kristen. We could take questions now. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star, then one on your touchtone phone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. The first question is from Finian O'Shea with Wells Fargo Securities. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, I guess for, first question, um, Greer, on the on the CLO uh, portfolio this quarter, um, you saw a pretty good rebound there in, in yields. I know I know cash yields were up this quarter for that um, asset class, but any um, any expanded color on a, a longer term fundamental improvement there? Uh, sure. So uh, this portion of our book, which is about 13% of our book, uh, small small portion of our assets, um, essentially worked uh, as as advertised. Uh, these are self-healing uh, vehicles, and uh, you go through a time of, of stress like you saw in 2020, uh, including a, a host of, uh, of ratings downgrades rippling through the uh, – the syndicated loan uh, market, um, and you see uh, you saw a temporary dispersion or di diversion rather of cash flows on a minority of deals, um, and that is largely uh, abated now. Uh, cash yields up to 17.2 percent. That was up about 1,100 basis points from uh, the prior quarter, and, and gap yields up about 320 basis points. To, to just under 17%. Uh, percent. Uh, from a longer-term perspective, uh, we're seeing not just uh, an increase in, in loan prices, but now a reversal of those uh, ratings downgrades becoming uh, upgrades, uh, which tend to be slower than the downgrades, uh, 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 typically the, you know, asymmetric, uh, but that's uh, moving in the right direction. You saw a troughing of trailing 12-month uh, default rates as well. We've always outperformed uh, the overall loan market um, generally by about 50%. So that has continued, but you're seeing a decline in those uh, LTM default rates and, and would expect that to, uh, to to continue just looking looking forward in, in a runoff of, of, of things that occurred uh, 12 months uh, prior for, for defaults. Uh, so we're, we're optimistic about the loan space. We're, we're also seeing benefits from LIBOR floors, by the way. Uh, sometimes floors uh, work to your advantage, sometimes to your, your <coughs> disadvantage. Um, you know, when the floor is obviously above prevailing rates and there's an increase in prevailing rates, it works a little bit to your disadvantage in terms of uh, if that's how your assets are structured. Uh, here, they work uh, to the advantage uh, because of those Floors, um, often 100 basis points or so, with LIBOR close to zero, uh, were being paid um, nicely on the asset side of the ledger uh, with the floor plus plus the spread, while the liabilities uh, have no such floor. So a number of positive things occurring here. This, again, is just a small part of our book um, and, and, and not, not likely to, to grow uh, on our balance sheet. Any follow-ups there, Finian? 
Um, that that was helpful. Uh, just if I could do one follow up on the uh, right side of the balance sheet um, for uh, you or perhaps Kristen, um, I think you you were saying that um, you would utilize the revolver more. Uh, we've noticed that. Um, it, it, any additional? Uh, I mean, I guess how much ideally would you say? And then um, if you have the numbers, um, can you remind us of your available borrowing base? Um, I'll answer the first part, and I'll ask Kristen uh, to, to respond on the, on the borrowing base, which, of course, is an iterative topic. As you uh, fund more originations, you pledge more, the borrowing base grows. So it stair steps upward as opposed to being static. Um, but uh, from a revolver utilization standpoint, um, historically over the long term, we've only had about 15% utilization. We've stepped that up to be... Uh, closer to, to 35%, um, and we'd like to strike the right balance between uh, having significant liquidity on hand uh, at all times. We think that's an important uh, de-risking element uh, with uh, utilizing our most efficient form of uh, financing. Uh, we have been retiring more expensive uh, debt through a series of tenders. Uh, we just called uh, a more expensive uh, traded baby bond. Uh, uh, that will actually be retired this week uh, from notice it was given uh, almost 30 days ago in conjunction with our new uh, institutional bond uh, issuance. So you know, we're calling paper that is in the five to six and a half ish percent range and we're replacing it with paper in more of the three to four percent range on a term uh, basis plus a revolver is just over one percent money so we've made nice strides to uh, trim our cost of financing on the right hand side of our balance sheet uh, we'd like to continue shaping that and, and use that as a driver um, but then, of course, just in terms of utilizing financing period, we are uh, under-levered uh, pretty significantly right now with only 61% uh, net debt to equity versus a, a target range of 70 to, to 85. Uh, and uh, we're, we're cautious, but we have a nice pipeline of, of deals where we look to uh, deploy uh, that capital as well. So cost of financing and amount of financing – are significant levers to pull as, as positive earnings callus as we see it for the future. And we have about $845 million of combined cash and undrawn revolver. Uh, Chris, you want to comment on the borrowing base, which, again, is static and increases as you pledge more assets? Sure, Greer. You just mentioned the 845 that we have on the cash and undrawn. Um, we currently have about $370 million borrowed with an additional $430 million additional $430 million available to us on our current borrowing base. Uh, thank you, uh, both of you, and congratulations on the good quarter. Thanks, Vinian. The next question comes from Robert Dodd of Raymond James. Uh, hi, guys. Um, and, and, yeah, I mean, congrats on, on an impressive NAV quarter, among other things. And, uh, yeah, congrats on being a top 100 stock on Robinhood, too. Um, for, for the NAV um uh, performance obviously up seven percent. A good chunk of that came from two assets in particular. I mean, not all of it by any means, but a good chunk of it. Interdent and and your meat. So, got a question, a couple of questions about that on interdent. But you know, obviously a material markup. First time that asset has been marked up above cost in a while, and, and that business had obviously been troubled for more than a decade. I think before you got involved with it. Um, so. You know, the, the question is: Has there been another restructuring? I mean, what's changed that that now seems to be on on a better path? I mean, the the you know, obviously, dental was impacted by COVID. There's been a rebound there, but you know, and there's still some headwinds there. But but what drove the big markup in that business this quarter? Sure. Um, well, I'm not sure. I completely agree. The entrance been you know, sort of a troubled company for 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 the you know, longer term, um, the company has has two parts to it. It has a, a Medicaid uh, 
based business in um, substantially in Oregon and then outside of Oregon it has uh, a you know, fee for services uh, uh, business in in other uh, states primarily in the, the western uh, region um, you know the Medicaid based business actually end up being a substantial plus counter cyclicality uh, in the, the course of the past year um, when you're paid a per member per month uh, rate and uh, your, your utilization uh, drops, you know, your cost drop, but you're still paid the same amount. Uh, we saw substantial outperformance in that part of the business model compared to fee-for-services, broadly speaking, out there in, in the industry. So while you're subject to, to reimbursement risk and, and, and what, are the, what is the Medicaid enrollment in a particular region, um, you, you have other substantial benefits during downturns that, that shown through quite uh, brightly. Uh, the business has been picking up market share and also benefiting from an overall growth in, uh, of enrollment uh, in that state. Uh, and just a general improvement in the blocking and tackling and efficiencies, broadly speaking, uh, across uh, across the business. So. You know, dental services, uh, recurring revenue business, get your teeth cleaned twice a year. Um, a lot of the uh, early on with the virus, there were concerns about going to the dentist. There's still a little bit of a lingering uh, 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 impact of that, but we're not nearly where we were in the spring of 2020 from that standpoint. So we're happy with the trajectory of the business. Uh, it's uh, performing well. You know, valuations continue to be robust from a comps uh, standpoint. Um, yeah, so that's Enterdent. And uh, I would say I, 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 we didn't really see our valuations as concentrated in a couple of credits. We had an across-the-board robust increase in valuations in the book. I think we had uh, maybe 20-plus credits, roughly, that had a more than a million dollar increase in uh, valuations, whereas uh, uh, on the downside, uh, we had you know, maybe only four or five deals that, that had a more than a million dollar uh, decrease. So the increase in valuations was, was very much broad-based uh, across the book and, and not just concentrated in, in one or two. Uh, a fair point, but 120 million of the appreciation it did come from two assets. That's that is uh, not not an even even split. But on on the REIT, if I can, at the risk of of digging up a, a, a very old issue, at what point does it become uh, appropriate to you know, maybe spin off? Isn't the right right thing to discuss? But it's it's 30 percent of NAV now. Um, that's that's a very large concentration, and yes, there's there's diversity. It owns lots of different properties. But if you had a a manufacturing business that had a hundred di different products, you, you still wouldn't want a manufacturing business to be thirty percent of your NAV, even if their product set was diversified. So, what's the right level for that to account for of of portfolio concentration? Because right now it looks like if it continues on this path, which I don't think there's any reason to, to, to believe it won't right now. It, it's going to become an even more concentrated part of the book. And, and what's the right level there? Uh, right. Well, a, a couple of predicates there. I'm not sure in complete agreement. Uh, the, the first is we have historically uh, sold individual assets uh, as we have, uh, have proceeded. In fact, we've sold 33 uh, properties. Uh, so uh, while NPRC and our real estate business have uh, performed strongly from a cash flow and, and, and total return and, and, and realized IRR standpoint, those 33 exits have generated a 23.5% uh, IRR. Um, you know, as we sell assets uh, selectively, and you know, you probably see us continue to pursue that. You know, 2020 was a little bit muted for M&A across the board, not just. Uh, uh, not, not just uh, within real estate, uh, then you know, that's a mitigating factor to what I would call high-quality problem of, of having uh, increases and in, in positive uh, results. We, we don't look at it 
through the way you started the the question of of a single concentration we 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 look at this on more of a look through basis from a business standpoint where we have dozens of separately financed uh properties uh with uh, a diversity of management teams and a diversity of uh geographies uh so much like you wouldn't take our middle market lending book and say that's a you know 69% concentration either so real estate's about 19% of our assets, but it is uh, very significantly diversified. Uh, there is no cross-collateralized uh, debt or, or other obligations. Um, every asset is its own individual financing. Uh, so we look at it on a look-through basis. And in terms of portfolio construction and our allocation to uh, to real estate, um, I think it you know it's unlikely to see your real estate kind of take over the book and become a majority or any, anything like that. Uh we we maintain a balanced origination approach it includes real estate it includes uh corporate credits. Um I mean you mentioned spin-offs I suppose that could be interesting to consider at some point potentially but what you see is that um private market valuations are uh, higher, and this has been the case for actually s several years, Robert, uh, compared to, to public REITs. Uh, and, and there's a number of reasons for that. One is the leverage at which assets run. Um, one is the, uh, I think, the players, the market, and, and the capital that's aggregated and earmarked in the private markets different from the public REIT side of things. Uh, some of it may be, you know, macro fashion sentiment uh, comparing REIT strato to tech stocks, uh, but uh, you, you do better selling your individual assets in the private marketplace as opposed to putting them into a, a separate standalone public uh, format. Um, but that's something we can continue analyzing over time in case that in case that changes. That, that that that's fair. If I can make a request to to your point. On, I mean, if I look in in the disclosures in the queue that we have on NPRC, I mean, it appears yeah, revenue minus opex minus interest expense. It's simplified cash flow. It's negative. Obviously, that's not representative of, of your 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 point that average IRR on exits is twenty three percent. So perhaps you could you could do us a favor, give us better disclosure on the REIT about cash flows. Um, and, and the mechanics of the IRR, because right now, if we look at the disclosures, it appears to be a cash flow negative business um, that does represent quite a large chunk of NAV. So that's just a request. But other than that, um, congratulations. Well, well Robert, if I can respond yeah. to that, because I, I mean, uh, a couple of things. First of all, um, you know, re real estate generates depreciation, right? It's uh, that, That's not an investment company and it doesn't use investment company accounting. REITs don't use investment company accounting, right? So the depreciation they spent off, uh, which may have been money spent uh, years prior, uh, is a factor, number one. Number two is what you're quoting there is also after giving effect to the um, uh, interest uh, rate that uh, Prospect Capital Corp charges to NPRC, which, of course, comes... You know, comes to PSEC as the home team, right? So, 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 so we're a beneficiary of that. That you know, substantially absorbs a good chunk of the net operating income. So, I don't think looking at some type of net income figure, which includes non-cash depreciation and amortization, that, that was ex and, for what it's worth. That's uh, excluding the depreciation, and that's to. to, okay. to uh, I sorry to interrupt, but right. <laughs> that's precisely my point. I mean, if I had, if there was right. more disclosure. We'd have an easier time figuring that out. Okay. As it is, just revenue minus opex minus interest, excluding depreciation, and fair value adjustments. That okay. number is negative, but that doesn't tell the whole story. That's that's. Well, well we will again. That's after it pays PSEC. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Understood. That's a huge factor. This is a significantly. I just want for the record. This is a significantly profitable net operating income business. It's not. A, it's not a, a money loser at all. Period. Full stop. But we will we will review the disclosures, and we already put in a ton of disclosures. We we, we released audited 
annual uh, financials for, for NPRC. We have pages and pages of additional disclosures. But we're happy to take any comments, suggestions. Um, you know, feel free to make them. We'll, we'll definitely evaluate them. Always happy to evaluate uh, I I increasing uh, and improving disclosures so for sure. But this is not a uh, money losing business by any stretch. Thank you. That's that's all my questions. Thanks okay. a lot. Thank you. And this concludes our question and answer session. I would now like to turn the conference back over to John Barry for any closing remarks. Okay, well, I do have a couple. Uh, one is that the improved performance at Interdem um, is the result of the uh, persistence, diligence, hard work, dedication of a wonderful management team that we have there. We have two people leading uh, the effort there who have overcome challenge after challenge, many outside of their control. Uh, that's one of the, uh, I, I guess it's not exactly a secret, but I think people often fail to appreciate the importance of having a great management teams uh, at our portfolio companies. And one of the absolute best is the team at Interdem. They've done a fabulous job. As well, the internal prospect team, which spends many, many hours on that asset, optimizing it uh, has done a wonderful job. We hope to see more of that. Normally what happens in our business, uh, unfortunately, uh, when there's a problem and we uh, are handed the keys to a company as occurred with Internet, that is after the sponsor has tried everything, every Hail Mary pass, Every every good, uh, indifferent, and bad idea, um, and uh, they've all failed. And the sponsor, uh, a brand name, leveraged by our firm, on the tip of everyone's tongue, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal again and again, has completely given up. I wish that were all that happened, but usually what also happens in the case of certain sponsors, and, and we know who they are, they've hollowed the company out. Well, we can't fix this. Um, we've tried everything, so let's uh, uh, leave with as much money in our pocket as possible and give it to Prospect. And then occasionally there's a demand that we pay money for that privilege, which uh, we have never uh, exceeded to. So we definitely start out deep in our own end zone when we take over these companies. Uh, and I think the case of Internet uh, shows that we're getting better and better at doing what the sponsor should have done in the first place and performing where the sponsor has failed and fixing problems that should have been identified ahead of us. Uh, and, and fixing them. And in the case of Interdent, we started by making significant management changes. And that's the whole story there. Uh, in the case of our, our REIT or, or any other uh, asset class uh, where we invest, I hope we continue to have this problem that Robert Dodd has identified where the asset class performs so well uh, under our uh, supervision that we have to think about uh, rebalancing by spinning off assets, selling assets, and the like. Uh, we hope to have that problem again and again and again throughout and across our portfolio. turns out that the REIT is fully diversified, many, many properties there. I've noticed talking to our shareholders that many of our shareholders appreciate the stability of uh, the cash flows at Prospect Capital Corporation. Maybe one business unit's doing better than another at a given time. Maybe aircraft leasing is doing well at one point and real estate's not doing so well. Or online lending is doing better uh, than our energy business. 
shareholders I speak to like to know that because of the diversity of our assets and the diversity of the cash flows, the significant cash flows those assets throw off, that a problem in the oil patch is not uh, a giant hit to NAV or uh, our income or uh, travel uh, largely shutting down uh, in the airline business isn't another uh, heavy blow uh, to us because what happens is uh, or people can't eat in restaurants. How exposed are we to that? Not very. Hotels, same. So while the idea of spinning things off uh, when they do really well has some facial uh, attraction, the shareholders I speak to like to know that there uh, are eight cylinders under the hood that are all operating, making this car drive as steady as she goes. So while we will consider spinoffs, um, right now it's not it's not at the top of our list. And as far as the real estate business being extremely highly uh, profitable and remunerative, um, you can't you can't be earning these these high IRRs, almost thirty uh, percent, if the business uh, were not positive uh, cash flowing uh, in every single quarter. So we are going to continue to work uh, with what has worked well in the past. We're going to be steady as she goes. We're not going to be making any um, uh, sudden uh, changes to business strategies that have worked well for us since 1988. We believe steady as she goes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye now. Thank you. Bye now. The conference is now concluded. Thank you all for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect your lines. Have a great day.